see the paper is in fact a joint uh, paper by myself and Elizabeth Fraser. We've been working uh, on and off for about 10 years now on um, quite exploratory work really, trying to see how uh, the relationship between politics and violence is conceptualised within the history mainly of Western political thought. Um, and moving on more recently to start to think more about issues of, of non-violence as well. Um, the paper today is, um, is, is based on the most recent thing that we've written, which is actually a piece for an editor collection that Christine Sylvester's uh, editing called Masquerades of War. Our piece is on the work of Gandhi and Fanon. Um, and I'll try and explain why we're finding looking at their work particularly interesting for thinking about the relationship between politics and violence. I hope that will become clear um, as the paper progresses. <coughs> I didn't want to just sit and read a paper, but I will be um, reading some sections of it, and then I've got a, a sort of bullet point type thing uh, with the PowerPoint so that people can see what's going on. Okay, so um, just to start with, this is a bit crude, but this is in a sense um, a kind of mapping of how we've seen the understanding of the relationship between politics and violence and what politics and violence means within work in history of, of Western political thought. And we're suggesting here four sort of positions, with the first two being the ones that are most predominant within uh, political theory, and with the latter two being counter-narratives, um, uh, but quite significant counter-narratives um, within Western thought as well. Uh, in terms of the predominant views, the classic understanding of the relationship between politics and violence is to see violence as a means for politics. It's another instrument, another tool that you can use to bring about political ends. This is obviously this kind of classic Clausewitzian view. It's the kind of view that's often associated with theorists like Machiavelli or with later theorists such as Weber, uh, for instance. So violence on that understanding is understood in purely instrumental terms and as being uh, often a, pre a, a predominant, sometimes simply one of the potential means or instruments for achieving political ends. The second um, view is one that sees politics and violence as antithetical. Now, probably the most famous sort of um, version of this is what you find in Hannah Arendt's very famous essay on violence, in which she argues that politics and violence are something entirely different. Politics is about people acting together, um, making new possibilities in the world, as it were. Violence, she argues, and here there's a very strong overlap with the first position, is simply instrumental. So she defines politics as fundamentally not being about instrumentality and violence as being an instrument. She talks about violence as having a role sometimes in almost, as it were, clearing a space for politics, but not in itself being part of politics. In many ways, standard liberal understandings uh, would, I think, be close to the Arendtian view in the sense that politics is understood as starting where violence leaves off or violence starts where politics leaves off. So if you look at predominant discussions in liberal political philosophy over the past sort of 30, 40 years, the post-Rawlsian years, as it were, violence hardly appears at all. It's actually not something that political theorists have been thinking about within that liberal tradition in a very major way. You find you know, work in the ethics of war that might be seen as in some ways taking over insights from liberal political philosophy into thinking about violence, but by and large, violence has not been a major concern. So there's, I think it's also the case that within liberal thinking, politics and violence are understood as antithetical. To the extent that violence is given a place, it kind of is a reversion to the first position. It becomes something, a last resort, something that you may need to use sometimes, something that you might need to use in order to, for instance, <coughs> protect civilians, etc., the kinds of humanitarian intervention type discourses. 
Okay, so within both of those first two positions, which are, as I suggest, uh, or we would suggest, the predominant positions, politics and violence are seen as different, and violence is understood purely as a kind of tool for the furtherance of particular ends. The counter-narratives give us something different, and here I'm thinking of... Um, <laughs> I mean, there's a certain, if, if you look carefully at what people like Clausewitz or Weber or Machiavelli say, actually it turns out that it isn't as simple as violence is just a means for politics. There's a lot in those thinkers about violence itself as a practice and notions of certain uses of violence being associated with political virtue. Uh, so this is actually a kind of, as it were, submerged part of the mainstream ways of thinking that perhaps we're not as aware of uh, in, in standard discussions of politics and violence. Um, there's also, of course, a very strong revolutionary tradition, in particular in the wake of the French Revolution, but perhaps most often exemplified by thinkers like Sorel, for instance, or maybe later some of the uh, work of, of uh, Benjamin on violence might be associated with this as well, in which violence is understood as, in some ways, a kind of um, creative process, something that constructs, something that constitutes. And as part of that tradition, also a notion of violence as a kind of, uh, as a mode of expression or, or an, an excess of political life that emerges at times. Um, now, I don't want to sort of go on in detail about these. Um, but I think what's interesting about these counter-narratives is that they actually make us think much more carefully about what violence is itself as a set of practices, values, assumptions, and draw attention, if you like, to the politics inherent within practices of violence. Now, to some extent, the two thinkers that I want to concentrate on today, um, Gandhi and Fanon, are... Um, situated very differently to mainstream thinkers within the Western tradition, or even to, I think, standard revolutionary positions within the Western tradition, things like Sorel and so on, although, of course, they were well aware of those um, uh, uh, modes of thought. Both of them working in a context in which the violence of colonisation was an everyday experience, I think made them have to think about the interrelationship between politics and violence and the politics of violence in a much more careful and fundamental way than perhaps theorists in the Western tradition had tended to do. In some ways, some of their ideas um, link to these counter-narratives, but in other ways, I think they actually offer us um, particularly rich and useful ways of thinking about what politics is, what violence is, and how the relationship between the two should be understood. So I'm going to move on now to um, talk about their work. Okay, so as I know you all know, uh, Gandhi and Fanon were both leading activists in struggles against colonial oppression. Both of them identified European imperialism and colonialism with violence in a very strong sense. For them it was the epitome of violence. In Gandhi's case, British imperialism and modern Western civilization more generally exemplified violence and coercion. Um, this word, himsa, coercion or violence. In Fanon's case, colonialism, in particular settler colonialism, as you found it in Algeria, was violent in an absolute sense that pervaded all aspects of the lives of both colonizers and colonized. For Gandhi, the key strategy for successful decolonization was non-violence, ahimsa. In pursuit of a political project of individual and collective self-rule, in which um, the village models, as it were, the republic, and the Indian nation, or the potential Indian nation, is a civilization that could, he argued, exemplify a radically new form of political community for the world as a whole, an exemplary form of political community. For Fanon, in contrast, violence had to be the strategy of the colonised. And this had to be a violence that was fundamentally opposed to the violence of the coloniser in itself and its ends. 
And it opened the way famously, as he says at the end of Wretched of the Earth, to a new history of man, radically different to the violent European history of man. In different ways, therefore, Gandhi and Fanon articulated political agendas of radical novelty. Their chosen ways of responding to an oppressive present were experimental and oriented towards a future that could not yet be fully known or even perhaps fully imagined. Now, it's often the case that Gandhi and Fanon are, are seen uh, for you know, very reasonable reasons as antithetical um, thinkers or thinkers who are um, arguing, as it were, from opposite ends. One is in favour of non-violence, the other in favour of violence. But we want to argue that on examination, the ways in which Gandhi and Fanon conceptualise and legitimate non-violence and violence respectively involve an ongoing construction and negotiation of the conceptual and practical boundaries of those two, of non-violence and of violence, and therefore we also want to suggest of politics and violence. This process is enmeshed in claims about truth and politics, means and ends, mind and body, individual and collective, and it's one that repeatedly exposes the difficulty of any attempt to fix the meaning of either violence or non-violence as opposed and mutually exclusive categories. Whilst at the same time it invents new, often paradoxical ways of trying to express the meaning of violence or non-violence as political practices. Both thinkers do the latter, try to express what it is that they're saying about violence and politics, as much through storytelling and as through abstracted, abstracted analysis. And, and this is in some ways the, perhaps the most troubling kind of implication of, of reading what they're saying carefully as opposed to the many positive implications. For both thinkers, a language of gender and war, which enables the identification of both violence and non-violence with manliness, emerges as a key way of salvaging and maintaining the meaningful, meaningfulness and legitimacy of their commitment to either non-violence or, or violent forms of resistance respectively. Okay, so the main part of the paper involves quite a detailed look at um, Gandhi and Fanon Vance. There are some um, chairs here. If any, there's a couple there. um, I'm not going to sort of go through all the details. So I've just sort of sketched out some of the key things that emerge from um, the the more detailed discussion of what Gandhi and Fanon are saying. So starting with Gandhi. Um, this central notion of ahimsa, which is non-violence, which obviously structures his whole sort of set of strategies from his time in South Africa onwards. It's exemplified in the early text in Swaraj in 1908, and, and um, he talks about it a lot in his letters. There's an amazing sort of set of correspondences over sort of 20, 30 years uh, in which he's forever being asked to extrapolate precisely what non-violence means and so on. Um, what I want to draw attention to here is how in his writings and his discussions, in his um, correspondence, but also in his more, as it were, theoretical, abstracted, academic type works, there's a, a very strong acknowledgement of the difficulty of being quite clear as to what counts as non-violence and what counts as violence. <coughs> so there's a whole set of discussions about, you know, under what circumstances it, uh, it, it might be. Um, can you banish the monkeys from the garden? Can you tread on the snake? Can you um, operate on someone? You know, people are always sending him these kinds of questions. Uh, while he's trying to explain and put forward this, this um, uh, philosophy of non-violence. And he deals with the attempt to try and pin down what non-violence is in a variety of ways in his work. Um, first quotation there, uh, again I haven't put the references in this, comes from his correspondence, you know, non-violence is a quality of the, of the heart, whether there is violence or non-violence in our actions can be judged only by the spirit behind them. Um, there's some very interesting passages where he talks about how in some circumstances doing violence may be the more non-violent thing to do. Um, and he's very, very self-conscious about how unintended consequences may shift what starts as non-violence across the boundary into uh, violence. 
So the second quotation refers to one of the occasions when he was talking about this, when he's reflecting back on um, a particular action of passive resistance um, in which, which didn't succeed and in which he's uh, trying to work out where the problems lay because he's very persuaded by the power of nonviolence to change things. Um, and he argues that actually although it seemed like they were engaged in a non-violent practice, actually because of the anger behind the action, it, it wasn't uh, fully uh, non-violent. And he's got this, you know, this kind of ambition to, to um, reach uh, a, a fully non-violent way of, 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 of practicing resistance against colonialism. There's, there's lots of interesting stuff here, lots of stories being told to try and illustrate how you draw the lines, how you decide what it means to act non-violently as opposed to violently. Um, one of the things that he's very insistent on is um, rebutting the view, which of course he would get from fellow resistors who are saying, you know, don't fall into the stereotype of the cowardly native who won't go off and, you know, um, stand up to the British in the way that he should. We should be using weapons. That Hin Swaraj, I know a lot of you will know, but some of you may not, is structured as a conversation between a violent revolutionary and a passive, uh, a passive resistor, a non-violent, um, you passive is a bad word, not very useful, uh, I don't think, but, you know, <coughs> someone who has embraced non-violence. Um, and one of the things that he's really insistent on is that non-violence can have nothing to do with cowardice. And he um, draws from a variety of um, religious texts, Hindu texts uh, and stories, um, and often accounts of warrior virtue to try and explain what it is that the non-violent anti-colonial activist uh, is doing. So what we get, I think, from the discussion of nonviolence in his work is this problem of stabilising the distinction between violence and nonviolence, and a variety of ways in which he attempts to overcome that problem in response to often queries that people are sending him about what they should do and how they should do it. Um, and I just want to tell one uh, story uh, which, again, comes up quite regularly in the, in, the, in the correspondence as a way of trying to explain to people how they should act. Um, the, it's, it's a classic thing when people are arguing with pacifists, you know, what would you do if somebody attacked you? Or what would you do if somebody attacked your wife? It's that kind of thing. Um, the allegory, the um, story is one of there's this tyrant who wants to rape a woman and there's a man who can protect her, what does the man do, should the man use violence in defence of uh, the woman. Um, and Gandhi argues when he's telling the story at one point that um, by putting himself in harm's way, by being willing to sacrifice himself in defence of the girl, not acting violently, but being willing to die as it were in, in her defence, this will be such a powerful move that it is likely to um, transform the tyrant, the evil doer's intention. Um, but there's also a little coda in which he says uh, something along the lines of, of presuming that the girl doesn't have the courage to act for herself, which means the girl committing suicide to save her honour. I'll come back perhaps to the implications of that story later, but you can see how, how gendered scripts and texts actually are playing quite a major role in trying to explain what nonviolence and violence are and trying to explain what it is that the nonviolent resistor uh, should do. Okay, I'm going to turn to Fanon now, and again I'm sort of squeezing together what is quite a, um, a, a detailed. Um, section looking at his arguments in Wretched of the Earth, focusing specifically on that text here, Wretched of the Earth. Now here of course we have the apparent opposite of Gandhi, someone for whom violence is a necessary 
weapon to fight uh, the colonizer. And this is a, a very, very famous um, quotation, the idea of violence as a cleansing force, something that existentially frees the colonized um, from the um, ways in which they have been demeaned and made inferior by the colonial process. Um, throughout the Wretched of the Earth there is a very, very strong sense of um, violence in that counter-narrative way that I was talking about earlier as something that constitutes and that can be both character and community building. Um, uh, there's lots of famous quotations that people have a tendency to sort of take out of the wretched of the earth. You know, he's talking about the great chain of violence, the great organism of violence, as, as, as he does there and so on. It's actually considerably more kind of complicated um, than that. Because when he is talking about... Um, he talks about violence at different levels. He talks about violence both in terms of an individual's actions and reactions to what is happening to them, and violence as being something that can help to restore the self-respect of individuals who have been demeaned by colonialism. But he also talks about uh, violence in the sense of the organised armed struggle, and he's particularly thinking of the FLN in Algeria here, um, as being... Community building in an obvious way, in that it's engaged in an independent struggle to build a new state, but also as in itself exemplifying a kind of community, in that within the community, uh, within the fighting force, they are organising all kinds of things, distribution of food, village production, what to do about people who are sort of monopolising and, and engaging in black market activities and so on. And he talks about a range of um, ways in which the soldiers in the FLN are experimenting politically with ways of organising um, the Algerian people in a way that then foreshadows the kind of political community that can be built um, at the end of the at the end of the struggle. So one way of reading Wretched of the Earth is simply to see it as this, you know, overwhelming endorsement of you know using violence against colonialism. Um, but actually, of course, it's, it's not that straightforward. Um, in the, there's a very, very famous chapter in which he talks about um, colonial uh, struggle, anti-colonial struggle and mental disorders. Um, it's a fascinating chapter if anybody hasn't read it. Um, but what it does is basically show how both individually and collectively people have been and are damaged by violence, whether they are fighting on the side of the colonizers or on the side of the colonized. So basically there's a very clear message in that chapter that violence makes people ill. A very, and Fanon, as most of you will know, was, a, was a, um, a psychotherapist, a trained doctor. He was dealing with uh, mental patients in, in Algeria. That's how he came to be there in the first, uh, in the first place. So I think what we find in that chapter is that the nice clear line that Fanon wanted to draw between the violence of the colonizer, which is completely and utterly oppressive, and the violence of the colonized, which is emancipatory and, and liberatory and foreshadows the new community that you're going to build at the end of the struggle, that line becomes totally blurred and... Um, complicated by the discussion of illness in that final chapter so that it doesn't seem as if one can make a nice clear distinction between colonial and anti-colonial violence in the way that it would appear his argument requires. Uh, as with Gandhi, perhaps a bit less so, but still to quite a large extent. There's quite a lot of stories, allegories, anecdotes told in the in the Wretched of the Earth to try and help make the point, to try and make clear these categories between colonizer, colonized, different sorts of violence, and so on and so forth. Um, and there's one point where he, um, at, at considerable length, um, <coughs> quotes from a Césaire play um, about a... Um, a, and, and the, the section that he, he quotes is uh, of a mother and son. The son, they're both slaves. The son has just killed the master. And he's in this conversation with his mother in which his mother is deploring 
his violence and the fact that he himself is about to be killed because he's uh, going to be executed for having killed the master. And he is celebrating his violence in relation uh, to the mother. And I think, again, it's a very interesting um, gendered script uh, in which the message of the positivity of anti-colonial violence is partly carried in relation to a notion of redeemed masculinity within that story. So it's about the, the man becoming a man and emerging out of uh, this oppression. But woman, or the mother, remains very much at the margins of the story, and if anything, is a kind of rather weak need collaborative. <coughs> um, obviously, it's a different story to the one that Gandhi tells about the rapist and the girl and the defender, but it's, it's a heavily and interestingly gendered script through which he is trying to underpin the categories that he's seeking to stabilise within the text. Okay, so what I'm going to do um, now is uh, go to the concluding passages of the paper and then try and sum up what I think um, comes out of it, both positively and negatively in relation to Gandhi and Fanon and the relationship between politics and violence. In contrast to predominant traditions of political thought, which treat uh, violence and non-violence in mainly instrumental terms, the first <coughs> two uh, positions that I mentioned at the beginning, neither Gandhi nor Fanon permit any easy answer to the question of what non-violence or violence mean, or how we can justify either non-violence or violence as means for political ends. They both offer us accounts of politics and violence as mutually imbricated, something that has to be lived with and through if there is to be a future in which the relation between politics and violence might be differently articulated. They both speak to the impossibility of an easy transcendence of violence in politics, whether through non-violence or through violence. And they both illuminate the intimate relations between the modern state and violence. I think, you know, Gandhi is really interesting on British imperialism here and, and um, Fanon on, on the... Um, the role of the French, and demonstrate how the relation between politics and violence is produced and reproduced and must therefore also be contested and resisted in experiments at the level of the individual as well as collective assumptions and practices. Although their positions are very different, because they were paying attention to violence or non-violence as such, we suggest, Gandhi and Fanon both make explicit persistent difficulties in defining and legitimising these terms. Both were fully aware for different reasons of the likely deceptiveness of the means they had identified as the instantiation of freedom, non-violence on the one hand, violence on the other. In Gandhi's case, he constantly explores the fragility of the line between violence and non-violence, not only demonstrating how non-violence may collapse into or turn out to disguise violence, but also perhaps more surprisingly suggesting that in some circumstances violence might be closer to the essence of ahimsa than a refusal of it. In Fanon's case we are shown how apparent non-violence may perpetuate colonial violence and the claimed efficacy of anti-colonial violence is undermined by his own observation of its pathological effects. I should perhaps have said that near the beginning of Wretched of the Earth Fanon very clearly targets um, not so much, I think, Gandhian non-violence, but non-violence as he saw it exemplified in some of the um, sort of bourgeois elites of the emergent African states uh, who were wanting to negotiate um, the transition to independence without violence. These difficulties of stabilising the distinction between violence and non-violence and even understanding what the two terms mean draw attention not only to the question of how the two concepts and practices relate to each other and, and whether and how we draw the line between them, but also to other kinds of line drawing. How are the distinctions between legitimate and illegitimate uses of violence or non-violence sustained? Gandhi works with a moral vocabulary of virtue, but also with one of pure intention and mixes deontological and character and duty-based arguments. Fanon's normative vocabulary is more fundamentally political, couched in terms of individual and collective liberation, that are not always consistent with one another. For instance, um, we can contrast the moment of personal liberation in the story about the two slaves of the, of the man who killed the master. Uh, 
and then the kinds of processes that he talks about with the FLN reorganising the way that food is produced in Algerian villages. In both cases, however, they understood that the work of establishing a new kind of political community was an open-ended creative but also paradoxical process for which an adequate vocabulary might not yet be available. They were clear that the kind of work in which they were engaged could not be pursued at all without danger and risk to the ends being pursued. Failures were inevitable and not specifically foreseeable. And it's in this context of uncertainty and the recognition of the likely deceits of their chosen non-violent or violent routes to different kinds of world that they both made use of stories, analogies and examples to help us, to help us fix and explain the meaning and value of the, of the ways in which they thought um, the anti-colonial struggle should be pursued. In the case of both Gandhi and Fanon, we suggest, the persistence of the way in which colonialism, oh sorry, the, the persistence of the way in which liberation from colonialism is linked to a redeemed masculinity, specifically identified often with notions of martial virtue, is one of the ways in which they try to, as it were, stabilise these very slippery distinctions that they're deal, dealing with. In the shifting and complex terrain of an ongoing political struggle oriented towards novel forms of political order, one of the ways to anchor the meaningfulness of that struggle, whether conceived and practiced in violent or non-violent terms, it seems is in relation to familiar gendered constructions of masculine courage and honour. Of course, this wasn't the only trope that Gandhi and Fanon used. It, there are lots of different kinds of stories in their work, but it is a significant one. And it raises, I think, the... Um, the serious question of how much our political imagination, as it were, can be released if in some sense it's still relying on actually very traditional um, gendered scripts for it to work. So to sum up, this is really what's sort of coming out of the uh, paper so far. First of all, I think it's clear that Gandhi and Fanon do not join the mainstream in thinking of violence or indeed non-violence, uh, in purely instrumental terms. This is not simply a tool for political action. It is in itself a practice which instantiates the end which you're also pursuing. It's that kind of idea. Um, I think the other thing is that they both are very well aware of the slipperiness of the particular lines that they both want to draw, in Gandhi's case, between violence and non-violence, in Fanon's case, between colonial and anti-colonial um, violence. So they understand that that's um, a distinction that is not straightforward and that, in a sense, is something that emerges in practice and then may, because of unintended consequences, turn out to be deceptive in terms of what it is you're trying to get. And then finally, they both use this narrative of a redeemed masculinity as one of the ways to help stabilise the distinctions that they knew to be fundamentally unstable. And I will stop there. Thanks, Kim. Thank you. <coughs> we have a considerable amount of time for questions and discussion, mm -hmm. so um, thank you for the paper. Um, anybody would like to um, ask the first question or tie to the discussion? David, yes? Um, I just want to ask a question about narrative and story there. Um, not aside from the question of gender, but, but in, a, in the broader sense of the relationship here between kind of narrative and I suppose concept and whether, whether you see this as a more general pattern in these discussions that, that narrative fulfills the role of covering over some kind of inadequacy within the concept of something that can't be conceptually worked out. And so, is, is story the <coughs> customary thing that comes in then to fill that that gap? And is, is that specific in that sense, I suppose, to Gandhi and Fanon and to, and to the particular concerns that you, you, you so beautifully outlined? Um, or is that is that true more generally within discussions of politics mm. and violence? Mm. Yeah, it's, it's a really nice question. I mean, I think um, Stories certainly, at least some of the time, it does vary somewhat from thinker to thinker, but I think stories actually are very crucial. Um, but also metaphors, um, 
certain sorts of um, analogies and, and uses of language. Uh, absolutely crucial. I mean, this is something I know Tom's um, um, done some work on in the past. Um, so I think, yes, and I, I think it's one of the sort of hubrises of a lot of political theory that it somehow imagines it's doing logical argument when actually a lot of the time it's not. It's doing some of that, but it's also doing a lot of other stuff that's kind of tapping into the way that our political imagination already uh, works. I think in this case, because both Fanon and Gandhi were very much having to speak to an audience, they were practitioners, they were trying to make things happen, it becomes even more important because you are swaying audiences. And for Gandhi in particular, using stories that were familiar to the audiences, a lot of whom would not have been literate, for instance, was a really crucial thing. So I think maybe it has a particularly vivid importance within Gandhi's um, work uh, because of the context within which he was working. But I, I certainly think as soon as political thought is actively intervening in some way, then it becomes even more central to the way in which it's, it's done. Yes. Um, so you, you said, um, I don't know if it's, if it's a criticism or not, but you said that, that both Gandhi, Gandhi and Fanon use it depending on gender the count. Um, so going back to Fanon's um, use of the César play and the, the, the dialogue between the mother and the son, and I just wondered whether is that necessarily the mother in a gendered role or is she actually just acting as the parent? Which, and so could not the father also behave in the same way? Yeah, I think, um, I, well, I think it is gendered. Um, it would, I mean, it would be, the counterfactual isn't there, in the, you know, we can't see it, obviously, with the father's discussion. I, I don't think it would have been impossible for a father to be um, giving the same message, but I do think that the... Um, <laughs> that the contrast is a very, very deeply gendered one, partly because of the way that the mother's uh, values are linked to nurture, care, non-violence, and also Christianity, which the son is saying, you know, I have this false baptism and they gave me a name that is not mine. I've now had a baptism of blood and I am my own man. And so I think and the way he speaks of his manhood, again, I think reinforces that. So I would say it is a gendered uh, script. I think you're right, though, that, um, that, there's a, that there can be a danger of over, oversimplifying. I mean, Gandhi is really interesting in this respect because, I mean, he uh, very um, obviously kind of... Um, utilizes femininity and feminization in his own persona and both Fanon and Gandhi um, were you know included women in their movements and in many ways you know kind of countered traditional views about about gender politics but I think it's interesting when it does seem that violence or trying to work out the difference between violence but you know the, the focus on violence you're never very far from legitimating modes that invoke gender in one way or another. Now, that's something that we've seen a lot in all the different thinkers that we've been looking at, so it's not just a Gandhi fan on thing. There seems to be something about violence as a practice. I mean, perhaps it's not surprising, but it, it, it the, the, the links with these highly gendered sort of sets of assumptions. Is that, is that not because um, violence... I don't know, maybe this might be generalisation, but the violence in itself generally is mostly an act of the man. Um, well, it's certainly true that there's a, it's one of the areas where there's been a, a very strong gender division of labour in terms of formalised modes of, of enacting violence. Um, this is really difficult because, I mean, there is actually quite a lot of work on, on women being violent and obviously there's lots of women soldiers and women have always fought but they haven't been recognised. So it's, it, there does seem to be a, something of a lack of fit between the generalised discourse and the actual empirical realities on the ground. Having said that, though, it is the case that, for instance, war and the division of labour there has tended to have you know, men doing the fighting and, and women fulfilling other kinds of roles. Um, so, I mean, that, and, and there we get into all kinds of difficulties, sort of the chicken and egg thing. I mean, you've got arguments about, you know, 
war needs gender because it's the only way you can legitimate it is by giving some kinds of sort of rewards to those people who are going off and doing the fighting or you have um you know gender is there in the first place and that in itself is what enables war to occur etc etc so there's a lot of debates and discussions of this but i do think the familiarity of these reference points but also the i mean th these these notions of, of um, courage and honour, they have enormous resonance even a, a, across um, cultures where, you know, status-based relations are supposed to have been disappeared for however long. They, 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 they really resonate with people. So there's, there's something about this discourse that works, um, and that presumably is why these two activists were using it amongst other things. Yes, yeah, uh, thanks for this interesting presentation. I'm wondering about the this kind of blurry, uh, obscure distinction between violence and non-violence. Uh, I'm wondering about the intentionality of it. Do you think that Fano and um, um, just uh, Gandhi did that deliberately to legitimize their discourse by obscuring this area between uh, both terms uh, uh, to reach a certain target or not? The second question for the sake of... Uh, falsification case, how do you think the receptiveness of both discourses of Fano, the French school of mission of civilization, Monsieur de Civilastris, which is actually more radical, more mentally constructed, and the English school which is more receptive to what um, uh, Gandhi is saying, how do you think this kind of receptiveness, the difference in receptiveness affecting the discourse of each one of them? Okay, so the first one, I wasn't quite sure whether you're asking me were they deliberately keeping the distinction obscure or were they deliberately trying to stabilise it? Uh, just both ways, actually. <laughs> I mean, I think um, it's obviously, you know, in some sense I can't say what was conscious and what wasn't. Um, what I can say is that in terms of the way the text works, um, and all the texts work, um, there are, it, it's very clear that what is claimed at one point to be a sort of clear-cut distinction at another point absolutely isn't. Um, so uh, the intentionality, I think, is more difficult. I think in um, Gandhi's case, perhaps, it's easier to see because he's often responding very specifically to a letter that somebody sent him about, well, you know, what do you do in this case or how do you understand what nonviolence really means and so on. Um, and he's searching for analogies, metaphors, stories that will try and make it clear. And he's also very self-consciously reflecting on his own practice um, all of the time. Um, and I think, I think the way that he himself um, sometimes decided that actually he hadn't got it right suggests that he must have been very, very conscious of the ways in, the way in which this distinction is not actually straightforward. It's quite difficult to sustain and, and maintain. Um, at the same time, of course, he was fully committed to the idea that striving for non-violence had to be the way to go, rather than just collapsing the distinction and forgetting about, you know, trying to sustain non-violence. Um, with, with Thanel, I think it's... it's, it's there's something very odd about that chapter on, on um, the mental disorders in some ways, because in some ways it doesn't seem quite to fit with the rest of the book. Um, and in many ways it does appear to sort of counteract and undermine everything that's there in the rest of the book. So it, it's, it's interesting the way that works again as a text. But even if you discount that part of the book, I think the, um, the, the ways in which he moves between a kind of individual level of violence working in a particular way and violence working within the collective of the FLN means it's difficult to read him in the straightforward way that some people have read him as just someone who was celebrating going off and shooting people. I mean, I think it, you know, it never was that, that clear for him. Um, in terms of the reception, you're talking about the reception in France now or then or...? At the time. At the time. Because it seemed that this kind of reaction from both countries was a bit important. Uh, and they put that in their mind, if I'm not wrong. Yes, well, and again, the comparison with Gandhi is 
interesting because obviously he was he was as it were fighting the British rather than fighting the the, the French. I mean, I think the French election is, is complicated in that there's obviously the whole circle of people involved in uh, existentialism, phenomenology, Sartre, etc., who thought that the you know the the Fanon's argument was extremely persuasive and extremely strong. Um, uh, Otherwise, I mean, I think the, I think it would have been more just a dismissal, you know, this is just an ideologue of this movement that, that we don't want to engage with or need to. And of course, in other texts, Fanon exposes the very fraught relationship he has with his own identity as French and Martinican and, you know, uh, so in black skin, white masks, you get, I think, a rather different story than you get in, in uh, Wretched of the Earth. Um, I was thinking about French and English. I, I gave this paper or a version of it in Germany um, last term. And one of the interesting things there was that nobody had read Fanon. Nobody knew anything about Fanon. They knew about Gandhi, but they didn't know about Fanon. Which I thought was really interesting. So, uh, we're in a post-colonial sort of you know, <laughs> trap here. Yes, Harriet, I can see yeah, you on. Um, yes. That was a, a great um, paper. Thank you. I've got one question and one comment. I couldn't help but um, think when listening to your paper about Mao, about Mao Zedong, because and, and in particular with reference to your, um, your, your, your comments about the gendered scripts at work in both their work, because Mao, and I'm not thinking about, and this may be, uh, may or may not be significant, I don't know. I mean, I'm thinking of the land reform period in the early 1950s when the nation state wasn't the um, unit um, um, sort of absorbing or, or, or uh, producing violence, but it was uh, land and land in the village in the rural areas when um, the script there uh, really departed from scripts that audiences were familiar with, which, you know, I, I, I take your point here and uh, really referred to uh, women neither as mother nor as virtuous daughter-in-law, but as um, a farmer whose passions, affect, emotions were utilized to um, produce violence as a creative tool to overthrow the land owning class and um, you know, so it was a kind of thing. So there gender and class come together. So um, I suppose the question there is to what extent do you think the gender scripts at work here are, um, um, can be understood uh, within um, because the main unit framework of their concerns was the nation state rather than something else. That's one, well I suppose that has become a question. The, the other, the, 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 the question that I thought I was going to ask um, was about um, Fanon and um, his work as a therapist and what emerges through that final mm -hmm. chapter, and uh, what, if he, if his argument is that violence, despite its uh, creative uh, dimensions, it uh, produces illness, and whether that's the colonizer or the colonized, uh, what kinds of gendered scripts, or what kinds of gendered references um, does he make within that, in other words, what kinds of illnesses visit themselves upon women rather than mm -hmm. men? Mm -hmm. And thanks very much for that. In the gender script there, um, with, you know, with yeah, with the other ones. Yeah. yeah. No, thanks very much for that. The the Mao example is a really interesting one, and I don't know enough to sort of comment very directly on it. But I think it's um, it, it it does remind me of how significant the sort of audience question is in relation to what you're using as the mobilising sort of factor. Um, and the relationship to land, clearly, here, in, in that context, had a power. It's interesting, because, I mean, in, in that, that's there in the Fanon as well. I mean, and, you know, the, 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 the relationship to land is very important, I think, for a lot of those um, African anti-colonial thinkers, too. Um, I would be interested to know more about... Um, what the language of violence was, if you like. So, um, is it, how, you know, 
are there, is, is it war metaphors? Is there, are there martial metaphors? Are there um, sort of um, uprisings? You know, what, what are the metaphors that are used primarily? The, I mean, the, the, the main metaphors um, that we use can be um, thought of through the notion of speak bitterness. When, so, I mean, the metaphors were um, metaphors that evoked uh, passion, emotion, so it's kind of Absolutely. resentment and Absolutely. resentment and injustice. Absolutely. So the metaphors were of suffering, bitterness, um, how bad it was under the, yeah. know, the, the, the old times and how wonderful the arrival of the yeah. uh, communist troops um, yeah. was. So, yeah. you know, struggle, certainly yeah. struggle, class struggle, not, not struggle in the... Um, in the uh, in the in kind of martial yeah. war mode. Yeah, yeah. No, that's really interesting, and I would I, I think that would then be quite distinct. Um, although, again, the the class suffering bit would also be there in Fanon, mm -hmm. so that was there as well as the you know the the link to the sort of uh, masculinity uh, term. But I think what's clearly different is the ways in which. Um, women are being incorporated into the struggle. Mm -hmm. Now in some of Fanon's other texts, and I was focusing on Wretched of the Earth, um, women are incorporated into the struggle and that, you know the whole thing about um, the role of women in, in, in the in, in planting bombs as well as you know carrying messages and so on. So there is, it's not that um, it's being ruled out that women can participate in violence, it's just that the language through which certain kinds of violence are being explained and justified is one that relates to this other sort of gender script. So I think it, it, I think that's a really interesting comparison. Mm -hmm. And they would have been comparative then pretty much exactly in terms of time as well. I mean, yeah. actually the yeah. early 60s, yeah. so, could, so it would be, it would be interesting to look at those together. Um, in terms of the illness gender chapter, I mean, one of the striking things about it is, uh, sorry, the mental illness chapter and the gender themes in there is how women really don't appear in that either, or gender doesn't appear in, ex in, in an explicit way. There's a, um, there's a lot of case histories which are fascinating. There's one about the daughter of a coloniser. Um, her father um, had been a torturer and an ex executioner of, of, of Algerians. Um, and her pain is to do with carrying her father's pain, her mental illness. The others are, are sort of, uh, you know, women in refugee camps who are pregnant, various kinds of conditions that might come out, and the references to women being raped, which you get quite a lot, but it's mainly about what the husband or the father does in relation to their wife or daughter uh, being raped. Um, so the, yeah, the, in, in many ways the discussion confirms that the gendered script that we found in, in the earlier part of the text in, in that part. But I think it, it, you know, again, I would say that that's, um, it's something we actually want to look at a bit more deeply is, is gender and fanon across the range of writings, because this is really just focusing on Wretched of the Earth, and in some ways I think it might be somewhat atypical of, of other of his writing. Question from Teresa. Yes. Um, thank you so much for this. I, I was wondering from the the point of view that violence is a means to an end, um, is not just a means to an end, but an expression of the community. Um, what do you think Fanon, for Fanon the role of violence in the post-colonial moment is? Because it seems clear with Gandhi the type of social relations that would take place in a non-violent society after colonialism. But Fanon insists much more, so much in this relationship between the colonizer and the colonized that. I don't know what happens in the post-colonial moment. What type of society, what type of community is this that used violence and how it constituted the community actually? Yeah. I mean, again, I think that's a really interesting question because he's in some ways very insistent <coughs> that that you don't know what this what this future community is going to be. It's a community to be built rather than one that you can uh, thoroughly envisage. At the same time, there are these references to the ways in which um, the uh, anti-colonial forces are, are organising themselves as, in some sense, prefiguring um, a, a new order in which there would be different relationships between the classes, um, in which there would be a... I mean, he talks quite a lot in Wretched of the Earth about the way that elite groups um, needed to, um, you know, go in, go in and amongst the people and and sort of start the people off, but then once the people got going, they would sort of carry things forward. And it is a lot of stuff that's very anti the sort of bourgeois nationalist elites. Um, so there are there are certain sort of 
um, intimations of, you know, there should be a, an egalitarian, a populist land should be, you know, distributed um, to everyone. Um, undoubtedly, yeah, some sort of socialism is, is I think, um, implicit, certainly in terms of the sort of welfare and economic organisation he assumes. But in, in many ways, the, the, there is this um, unwillingness to specify uh, and it's, you know, at the end, it's so sort of broad. We need the new man, we need the new... But, it, but in a way, that seems right, because he's actually... This is something that's being built or needs to be built, or, and, and you can't know what it is in advance because you're trying to avoid the traps of the existing ways of thinking about the state. Because I suppose the other thing that he's very conscious of is what he sees as the kind of sellouts that have been going on in negotiated decolonization processes elsewhere in, 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 in the world. Um, but yeah, he doesn't say a lot, um, and as you say, with I mean, it, he idealizes, I think, the military in some ways, actually. So the the positive version of relations comes through as much as anything in the way in which the FLN operates in relation to the communities, um, and that is, I think, you know, whereas uh, and with with Gandhi, I suppose you do get something similar in that the the relations are those that. Um, characterize the ashram, characterize the ways in which the um, uh, various kinds of, 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 of campaigns of resistance are, are organized. But yeah, the, Gandhi puts more flesh on the bones, although at a rather micro level, which of course is one of the problems for the, for the future. Um, Bridget, yes. Um, I don't know how well, I can formulate this, I'm going to try. Um, I thought it was interesting that you didn't mention really reason or rationality very much. Um, and that's you know, a common way of you know, contrasting violence with, with reason. And uh, so if we think about um, Gandhi's argument um, that nonviolence is virtuous, that makes me think of Aristotle or Plato, that idea that, um, that virtue is, is self-restraint, it's temperance, um, and so virtue consists in a, a kind of rational judgment in, in, in reason um, about how to act or when to act. Um, and through uh, nonviolence, the, the soldier or the man is retaining his humanity by not uh, resorting to violence, which is animalistic, it's, it's non-human. Um, and so in, in, the, in the example, in Gandhi's Example: The man puts himself in in harm's way by not fighting back, but by putting you know putting himself in the way of violence, but not actually fighting back. So he risks his life to sh to show to retain his humanity, um, to show it, you know, to make a statement, and to but, but also to retain his, his humanity by not resorting to violence. In the woman's case, it's interesting because in order for her to be virtuous, she can't just offer herself up to the rapist, she can't stand in his way because then he'll just achieve what he sets out to achieve. Um, she has to kill herself. Um, and so she places herself in harm's way, but she doesn't just risk her life, she, she has to give her life up to retain her humanity in the situation. Um, with, with Fanon, um, violence is seen as liberating a violent uh, struggle against oppression in that context, only in that context. Uh, and, um, and, and so what that shows is that a full man is someone who acts purposively. So again, there's kind of reason in there, there's, there's a rational decision, um, and it's acting for the sake of not oppressing another person, but of claiming his own humanity, his own full humanity. So I think that might be this distinction between why it's why it's liberating and cleansing to to commit violence when you're uh, you know throwing off oppression and why it isn't when you're just trying to oppress someone else. Um, but you so you become a kind of self-conscious person. And what I thought also was interesting in the um, in the example that Fanon used was that the mother's objection to violence is not rash it's not a rational kind of judgment. It's not a rational objection to violence like it is in Gandhi. It's it's kind of presented as false false consciousness or something like that. You know, it's a, somebody who can't think for themselves because they're they're in, they're inside a slave mentality or something like that. So just that that could be quite fruitful to think through the 
you know, the relationship between in each one between violence and and reason, and see where where that puts the comparison. Yes, I mean, I think that's that could well be the case. I mean, I suppose um, I'm not sure that um, violence is associated with unreason um, necessarily by either of them. I felt like it was in Gandhi. I feel like it is in Gandhi. Yeah, I'm not sure that he, I mean, he thinks it's time. wrong, but I don't not think he time. thinks it's unreasoned. Um, I don't think he thinks it's irrational to use violence. Okay. He thinks it's wrong to use um, violence. So um, in, in that sense, I'm not sure that it quite um, works. But I think, I think the point that... Um, well, I suppose the other thing is the, the sort of attaining humanity thing. Um, again, I'm not sure that's the language that's entirely what Gandhi... I mean, I think you're right about Fanon. I think that works well there. I'm not so sure about um, Gandhi. I mean, at, at some level, I guess, it, I mean, we, we go back, I'm afraid, to sort of old chestnuts about how rationality is being understood. So if you're not understanding rationality in pure means end sense, but understanding it in terms of a sort of enlightened... Conception of the good or something, then then one might be able to um, square those. Um, but I I agree. I mean, I think it's true that rationality is working somewhat differently in the different cases. I'm not quite sure whether that counters or confirms the gendered script. It seems to me, on the whole, it probably would reinforce it rather than undermine it. Um, but for me, it's more interesting that the the woman has to give her life, the man has to risk his life. I mean, that, that seems to me to be the interesting contrast uh, there. Um, and the mother, I think, yeah, not necessarily being, I mean, certainly false consciousness. Um, it's not quite the same as irrational, I think, in terms of the Cesar play that he's quoting. So, I mean, I think you, there's no question that certain themes of rationality work through this. But one would need to, I would need to do more work uh, separating out the different senses of, of reason in there as well. It's not actually the term that most often comes up, you know, as, as a term, as a, as a concept. I just mean uh, that in the, the discussion that, that, really, that violence is unreasonable. Yeah, but you that see, I don't, I don't think I, yeah, you see, I don't, uh, you don't think I, don't, I don't think either of these thinkers is, is, um, I don't think Gandhi's rejecting violence because he thinks it's unreasonable. Um, I think Fanon is... I mean, there's part of the Fanon argument is quite an instrumental rationality one. You need violence to overturn colonialism anyway because of the way that it is. Um, in the sense of um, a strong version of what rationality is, being linked to a conception of the good and so on, then I think, yes, uh, that... that the, the violence used to counter oppression is a rational violence, as it were. But the language he uses, again, to describe that, about release, about desire, is not one that really relates very strongly to, to, to um, the vocabulary of rationality, I would say. So I think I'll have to think more about that to see how those threads may interact with other uh, metaphors and concepts in the in the argument. Yes. Right. Um, I've got a, another question which um, and it, it really um, it may be slightly unfair, I don't know, because it, it, it refers to the um, paper we heard in the same seminar last week. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> Before we were <laughs> Which was um, um, it was an attempt really to it, it, it started out as a it, it was a critique of the inadequacy of political theory really to account for the role of um, what, what he called, Mike Duffy called, patterns mm -hmm. um, in, um, in political practice. And, um, and he traced a, a, a kind of trajectory from the, um, line the lineage, the clan, through uh, the group, the kind of Robin Hood type, bandit type group to public politics and trying to think about this 
listening to your paper, and um, particularly about Gandhi, about whom I know very little, you know, you, you um, made a, a couple of references to his um, evocation of anger and resentment, and the, of course that this is in the head, you know, even if you don't act on it, or you don't translate that into physical action. And Fanon, I mean, refers a lot to these kinds of emotions. And I just wondered whether you think that uh, these two, that, that, that their work might um, contribute something to thinking about how we account for the role of the sort of emotional life, you know, precisely the, you know, which is not susceptible to any kind of conscious, rational ordering in um, political practice. Mm -hmm. So it's, a, it's, a, it's just a, it's a question that, you know, for reflection, really. I wondered if you think that there's, you know, that, they could, that their work could offer anything. Oh, absolutely. No, no, I think that's quite right. And I mean, both in terms of the sort of richness of, of the ways in which they trace links between, as it were, what's in the head and what's going on in the public um, domain, but also because they're thinking about um, politics as a practice, as something that people are, are doing and engaging with. Um, not um, in a kind of bureaucratic mode of sitting and planning, it, not in a mode of government, but in a mode of doing politics. Um, and so I think, yes, their work is very, very rich in that respect and is very clear about the significance of emotions and so on. And if you, I mean, again, this is one of the things that's a bit peculiar about predominant strands of contemporary political theory, which, you know, the post rawlsian sort of work, which is all about detaching yourself from particular problems and trying to work out an answer to them through, you know, rational argumentation effectively. But if you go back to people like Machiavelli or Weber or Clausewitz or Aristotle, you know, the, the emotions, the feelings are all there. So in some ways it's, it's a peculiar aberration of contemporary political theory. I think that this stuff isn't getting... Uh, the notice that it should. So we've recently had a big thing in international relations of people suddenly rediscovered the emotions and you're starting to get people, you know, giving us books about emotions and IR and so on. Sure. And yeah, and that's great. But of course, you know, traditionally everybody was very well aware of, of emotions and also of unintended consequences, uncertainty, the impossibility of controlling the world was absolutely central to, you know, the um, work on politics until really, I think, quite quite recently. Um, so yeah, I think Gandhi and Fanon are both great in that respect. And, and they're also, I think because they were activists, mm -hmm. they have a different kind of grasp and perspective than you get if you're not. And it's the same with, you know, Machiavelli was an engaged politician, Locke was someone who was, they, these are people who actually were part of um, politics and not just as it were writing about it from a detached perspective. And I think it does mean that you appreciate the complexity, the visceral nature of a lot of political engagement, the role of the unconscious, the role of the unintended, all those things come to the fore. Kim, um, I have a question in relation to the re redeeming masculinity. And, and in some ways, is there a subject position that is femininity? And if so, how do you define that? Because um, obviously, I think Harriet's question was, was about accounting for stuff, and obviously I was thinking all the time about Judith Butler and accounting for oneself, and in some ways there's a negotiation of the, you know, accounting for certain types of acts or non-acts or certain, certain types of violences and non-violences. So, um, is, you know, so, so is there a, a, you know, a possibility of imagining some sort of, I mean, is there a need to imagine some sort of femininity? I'm thinking here in terms of feminist ethics. Um, but also um, thinks about things like suffragettes and, and violence in the body and the food and, and you know sort of what that means in terms of um, symbolic structuring of a sort of a movement for change for women's equality and, and so what does that mean and and, and so so that that's sort of a question question about the sort of the, 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 the feminine and the status of the ontology or whatever mm. you want to say of mm. the feminine mm. but also in terms of um, the second question about purity and hygiene and, and sort of your paper draws upon and, and, and mobilizes and, and uses things, you know, obviously you talked about um, a cleansing force and there being moral purities. Um, is, is this again linked to that sort of um, back to Judith Butler and account of oneself is that we can't have these 
moral purities and sub, you know, the, 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 these clean slates. In some ways, just war theory and you know, just dirty hands and that concept, which is a you know, very existential sort of claim, is, is that still we're associating ethics of, and discussions around moralities of violence as being pure or impure. And, and, and so I'm just wondering what's the sort of so-called political economy of purity that's working through, through your analysis of these two thinkers. And perhaps mm. let's, let's generalise and say the whole of Western people. <laughs> Western know, people. Or on camera, we better be careful. Okay, um, yeah, I mean, I you seem, in a sense, to be. I, I felt you were asking me on two kind of registers. Then, what was a sort of register of what's within the texts and arguments that I'm looking at, and another is a register of what I might want to say um, about it from outside of the uh, yeah. of, of there. I mean, I think um, it seems to me that the the uh, notion of a redeemed masculinity associated quite strongly with the warrior masculinity in the Gandhi and Fanon texts we've been looking at has uh, it's kind of given other in, in a, 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 a femininity which precisely as Bridget would say is, is the one that gives um, rather than risks mm -hmm. um, and I mean the role for instance that um, I mean Gandhi believed in women's equality and needing to have the vote and stuff but he thought that that women had distinctive characteristics and abilities and in many ways it was quite a Victorian vision of what you know the woman as guardian of health and home that he really liked and it was building on some of those values uh, that, that he wanted to incorporate them into the movement for um, independence so in some ways I think we are in a rather Victorian world here in which um, woman gives, woman sacrifices, um, and that can be used symbolically as part of a fight. It can be used in order to um, uh, struggle against colonial power. You know, a bunch of women lay down in front of whatever. Um, but it still keeps you within actually a fairly tight and very traditional economy of masculinity, femininity, I would say. And I mean, you know, this has been an ongoing issue for feminism over the years. To what extent do you build on and utilise existing um, understandings of, of, of gender as a relational concept in order to uh, fight your battles? To what extent do you try to, um, you know, get away from that? And I suppose, I, I, I think in some ways, that can just be a st tactical or strategic question, depending on what you're trying to fight with or for at a given time. Um, there are obviously other kinds of tropes of femininity that you could use and, and engage with as well. So I don't think there's one. I think there's lots of different ones. But within this particular set of discourses, it seems to me it is a, a, a quite a traditional sort of masculinity, femininity economy that's going on. Um, in terms of the stuff on purity, etc., I mean, I, I think here... Um, Gandhi clearly did have a very strong um, discourse of purity going on in his work, purity of intention, but also um, in terms of how you live your life and, and so on. Uh, and, you know, this linked clearly to uh, his, his um, Hinduism and the ways in which he adapted and used it in his, in, in his work. Um, nevertheless, a lot of what he says indicates, uh, to use a Butlerian sort of word, the mutual contamination actually of violence and non-violence or of what you're, uh, you know, what you're hoping is pure and then turns out not to be quite so pure. So I think he's, he's more political than sometimes perhaps people will be willing to um, recognise. And it's similar with Fanon. He talks about this cleansing force and then he explains just what happens to someone who has blown somebody else up and the post-traumatic stress that they deal with and the ways in which they can't cope afterwards. So it seems to me that actually they're both quite good at undoing any discourses of purity that they might engage with. In terms of my own position, I do not think you can sustain an ethic of purity. I'm kind of pro-Butler in that sense. I think all ethics are going to be contaminated yes. about contamination at some kind of level. Mm -hmm. Mustafa, thank you. Mustafa. Yeah, sorry for disturbing. I'm asking about methodology. Mm -hmm. I'm rewriting my chapter for three years now on methodology. And, uh, mm -hmm. Regarding the masculinity part, uh, just the first of all, 
just how do you measure the uh, the framing of masculinity, femininity, against the other narratives or frames in the text? Because this is a second part. Is I feel that it's a methodological conundrum for me right now because Fanon was depending on a Marxist narrative, which is let's bring them down and just just deconstruct all ideological state apparatuses are there. It's very Marxist and uh, thinking of men and women as equal, uh, because I'm having in mind now the PKK, which are using the same Marxist, stay away yeah. for women, because yeah. they are even in Algeria, they were part of the struggle, don't alienate mm -hmm. them. Mm -hmm. And I'm thinking as well of, uh, of, uh, of uh, uh, Gandhi as uh, post-structuralist, his power is everywhere, more traditional, more Hinduist. Mm. So he's not stopping at this stage of men-women mm. dichotomy mm. in a way. Mm. So how did you, mm. you reconcile, find this this element within this kind yeah. of discourse which is more nationalistic yeah. and uh, less masculinist yeah. in a way? I mean, it's, it's um, it, you're, you're completely right. Um, there are a series, there are lots of different framings going on. Um, and I don't think there's any nice social science method that you can use to identify which are the most significant framings at the end of the day. Uh, you're engaged much more in something much more analogous to uh, uh, what colleagues over there will know a lot more about than me, which is textual analysis and looking at and analysing the predominance of examples, the way certain terms occur and recur. Now, obviously, you can do that more sort of scientifically. There's lots of programs that will analyze yeah. language for you. But uh, in terms of the ways in which um, I work, it's, it's more impressionistic than that. And it always has to go along with a kind of health warning. This is not the only thing that's happening in this text. This is one of the things that's happening in this text. And I think it's interesting and important and does work. But I couldn't claim that it's the only thing going on in that text. So it's, it's, it's really difficult, you know, the, 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 and, and I don't think our standard repertoire of social science methods gives us very much in, in terms of that. You, you need to look more to, well, I mean, you could look at more history political thought type techniques, you could look at sort of Skinnerian ways of getting at meaning, um, or at, you know, as I say, working more impressionistically, as I've tried to do here, and being a bit careful, really, about how much you claim on the basis of what you've read. Um, so you're not wrong to say there are other frames there. There are, there are, um, but fundamentally, they you, you are talking about you know reading and paying attention to the themes that recur and the language that recurs within the text, which is probably not very helpful for your chapter. There's about three sentences there. I'm, I'm, not going to call you to <laughs> I'm not the best person for methodology discussions. It has to be said. <laughs> Time for a couple more questions. Um, oh, yes, I worked over coming up. Yes, <laughs> I, 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 I think you've phrased this very well. I, to what degree is this this problem over defining violence and non-violence in Gandhi's panel um, framed by a question about how what counts and doesn't count as violence? And, and I'm thinking particularly about the, the shared context of colonialism, the specificity of colonial violence and of you know, repressive state apparatuses and so on that's associated with that, in relation to kind of larger debates within the Marxist tradition or indeed the feminist tradition around forms of violence that may not be immediately physical or repressive, whether we think of them as ideological or structural or systematic or whatever. And so I'm, I'm wondering, is it, is it because of the specificity of the colonial situation here that, that means that there's a, a definitional problem around kind of physical violence that tends to, pre, to predominate, where, where I guess a kind of, sorry, to fan us, a, a contemporary, contemporaneous for him, Marxist tradition is in some way trying to un, undo that precisely because it wants to argue that capitalism is as violent as totalitarian societies, definition, uh, but that it takes a different, more mediated structure. Yeah, yeah. Sense, I'm sure that's a question. But yeah, no, but I mean, it's, it's a really good and, and interesting point. I mean, one of the things Liz and I have struggled with over the years of trying to 
trace and think about violence and politics is um, you know, how one defines violence in the first place is extremely problematic. And I think Fanon is interesting here because he does, I think, um, include structural violence within his understanding of colonial violence very much. Um, but I think it is true that the reason the focus is on you know, the, the practice of injuring and out-injuring, to quote Elaine Scarry, is because it's, 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 it's because the context is the anti-colonial struggle and, and you're therefore trying to think about what tactics, what is your strategy, what do you do? Um, so I, I would say that was why. But, uh, but I think Fanon's actually very good on demonstrating the continuum between literally shooting and, and hitting people and um, keeping you out of certain areas and depriving you of education. Yeah, I mean, I think... That, that continuum is really beautifully demonstrated within the Wretched of the Earth, really, really powerfully. I think with Gandhi it is a more spiritual quest, you know, this, 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 I mean, he comes to nonviolence partly as a tactic that will work, but, but it's a way of life, it's not just that. So it, it, it is... Um, spiritual. Spiritual, yeah, I think. Sorry, you're not sure this is. <laughs> because I think it's about, it's, it's, it becomes about who he is and about um, aiming for a truth that is beyond, actually, the particular political struggle that he's part of. Whereas I think with Fanon, it's absolutely, you know, embodied in the here and now, and there, there is no beyond um, other than the potential future political community for him. Whereas I think with Gandhi, there definitely is. Um, so I'm not sure that really responded, yeah, no, no. but but I do think Fanon's very good actually on on uh, on showing why it is that structural violence is still violence. You know, actually showing that continuum really really clearly. Um, I mean, one of the things Liz and I have just really struggled with is is some of the language of some contemporary theory. It seems like everything is violence. Then you just think, well, what's the point of the category if everything collapses into it? So it's trying to keep it meaningful, but at the same time recognise that clearly it does go beyond just specific injuring or hurting of others. I suppose the question I think you're following on from that is, is in Fanon then, it's a long time since I've read the rest of the earth, I mean, is it, is it the non-structural violence in which, which legitimates the use of an equivalent of violence? Because, because that would then seem to become an issue of yeah, what I think, happens yeah. to Fanon outside of the colonial context where he has often been used and read sure. to defend an ocean sure. of, 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 of direct violence. I'm not, I think it's all part of the package for him, so it isn't just one aspect of it that justifies that. I think it's that because the violence is so absolute, yeah. because it isn't simply the encounter of individuals with other people who are shooting them or hurting them, hurting them periodically, it's the constant, constant, constant formation of, of people through a whole set of interrelated violences. Uh, so I think it's that holism, in a sense, that for him means... The, the only way to break out is, is, through, is through violence. It seems the otherwise you will end up buying into some aspect of what's there. And that's, of course, what he thought other um, African nationalist elites were doing at the time. Well, I think we've grilled you quite sufficiently. <laughs> I hope they're non violent. Well, thank you very much. Um, that was great. Yeah. Um, we, we try to make everything non violent. Um, <laughs> but um, we really appreciate you coming to speak to us today, so thanks, Kim. Um, please, there are still some sandwiches and some crisps there, so please, and, and some tea that's been uh, brewed. So um, if you'd like to you know, stick around, please enjoy some of the faculty's hospitality. So, <laughs> um, thanks very thank much. You.